uh, people may have seen this uh, um, paper that Mr. LaRouche wrote. Uh, it was published in June of uh, 2014, called The Four New Laws to Save the United States, USA, Now, Not an Option immediate and an Immediate Necessity. Um, and for the first thing I want to say about this is that um, this uh, writing, which is relatively short, yeah, some of you may, may or may not have uh, had a chance to read it, um, might, uh, might strike you as sort of, what is he talking about? Um, but um, I would draw to your attention that one of the, uh, the title of one of the papers that Mr. LaRouche wrote could have been back in the 1970s or the 1980s, I'm not sure, it was called Poetry Must su uh, Supersede Mathematics and Physics, which some people might think provocative title. Um, but what Mr. LaRouche, uh, who made certain discoveries in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, uh, demonstrated the connection between a creative discovery by a human individual, whether it be a discovery of a physical principle of nature, such as in the physical sciences, or whether it be a discovery of an artistic principle involves exactly the same capabilities of the human mind. And it, it's this process of discovery of truthful universal physical principles that is responsible for causing an increase of what he called relative potential population density. The ability of the uh, human species to raise itself to a higher level of existence on the planet. Uh, so, this piece does have that character that if you sort of dig into it and are not exactly sure what he means, if you look back at some of the papers that Mr. Lewis has written going back decades, you'll find uh, what he said on this. So, I just want to briefly um, uh, indicate that when Mr. LaRouche wrote this uh, paper, he wrote it with the idea of intervening on two processes that are occurring in the world. One of them we've already heard about. Namely, that, as Gilles mentioned, uh, you had, uh, around this time, uh, June 2014, June of 2014, it was already clearly evident that a process had been set into motion when the uh, President of China, Xi Jinping, announced in Kazakhstan uh, a proposal uh, to take the model that China had used over the last previous 30 years to lift 700 million people out of poverty and to make this model available for other nations around the world. He proposed what he called a new Silk Road policy. Uh, this is what he's referred to as a win-win cooperation between nations in Eurasia using modern technologies such as high-speed rail, nuclear fission, research in uh, thermonuclear fusion, and cooperation in space. Uh, this <clears throat> process that was launched in 2013, building upon what China had done going back well, over a generation, has already created a, a real explosion of development in the world. Uh, already this uh, project uh, in Eurasia is 12 times larger than the Marshall Plan, which is a plan that rebuilt Germany after World War II. It involves now 100 nations or in, uh, large uh, international organizations. And it's a, a, a policy that extends beyond Eurasia into Africa, into South America. Uh, and it was just about two weeks ago, a presentation that Helga LaRouche gave at a conference of economists in Peru that if you have a chance to go to either our website, the Committee for the Republic of Canada, or our website in the United States, the Rouge Pack, um, this was a fascinating uh, presentation of the, the uh, direction and the scope of this uh, policy at this point. And as Jill mentioned, this is a policy that is now not only intervening into the United States, okay, in terms of the potential that you have, but also into Canada and other nations around the world. Uh, the uh, report that 
uh, we wrote actually two years ago called The New Silk Road Becomes the World mm -hmm. Land Bridge. Uh, in fact, the, the, some of the uh, rail lines on this map uh, have not, there are new rail lines that, that exist now that, weren't, that are not on this map. So this is sort of one indication of the rate at which this is developing. Okay. Um, on the other hand, the uh, process that Mr. LaRouche was in, uh, intervening into is the fact that the entire transatlantic financial system is facing now a larger explosion than in 2008. Because the two big to fail banks are much larger than they were in 2008. Uh, Deutsche Bank, for example, alone has 42 trillion euros of financial derivatives. And the interconnection of this one bank, which is no longer simply a German bank, it's tied into, you know, Britain, it's tied into the United States. Uh, one uh, uh, failure of the, this uh, connections of these uh, uh, financial derivatives could bring down the international financial system. And, and on top of that, you have these large banks, many of them who have um, uh, are no longer there's no longer a distinction anymore since the, the destruction of a law in the United States called Glass-Steagall, which separated commercial banking from investment banking activity. So you have these large banks that. Uh, have large amounts of speculative assets uh, that they've amassed by basically having access to, to depositors' accounts, and that they, many of these banks have been caught um, engaging in criminal activity, things, everything from manipulating the interest rates, the, what's called the LIBOR rate, to drug money laundering, uh, to actually outright fraud against their own depositors, as you've probably heard with uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, so, you have a situation where you don't really have a banking system, you know, in large parts of the, what's called the transatlantic part of the world, the United States, Europe. You don't have a banking system that's able to issue the kind of investments required for uh, uplifting the capability uh, of our part of the world. So, uh, Mr. LaRouche issued this warning also, if you read this uh, document, uh, LaRouche's Four Laws, he warned of something called bail-in provisions that uh, people might have heard where it was imposed in Cyprus back in the spring of 2013, which <clears throat> allowed in Cyprus uh, certain banks that were in trouble to get uh, the ability to convert uh, bank accounts with uh, depositors, deposits of bank accounts greater than 100,000 euros were converted from uh, bank deposits into uh, equity in the bank, essentially laying the basis for a real crisis and destruction of the Cypriot economy. So therefore, it's a, it's a very good idea that you have had very, very good development that the American voters have decided to give a re resounding rejection to the policies responsible for this crisis. Now, on one level, one of our people, Paul Gallagher, who writes for the Executive Intelligence Review, said in a recent um, what's called fireside chat, that he characterized it this way. He said, the American voters, particularly those from formerly industrialized Rust Belt states like Ohio, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, they said to themselves, well, here we have a candidate for president who's a big builder and who says he's against free trade, he's against NAFTA, uh, he wants to stop the, the TPP, he wants to renegotiate all of these trade agreements, and that he doesn't want the United States involved in wars all over the world. And that's what they voted for. But this phenomenon that we're seeing around the world, which, as Jill indicated, we've seen before in, in Britain with the Brexit vote, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe and Moldova, reversed the process of hostility towards Russia, we've just seen in, in the United States with the election of Trump. You're not looking at a phenomenon where people simply want to go back to the past and change some stupid policy and say, okay, let's, why don't we do now what we should have done then? Uh, even if they don't know what it is yet, uh, people are indicating they want to take a leap into the future. So, <clears throat> and we're going to hear more about this uh, later from Matthew, but um, what Mr. LaRouche is insisting in this paper, his four laws, is that if you want to understand how to do that, how mankind takes a, a leap into the future, 
you have to study what are the characteristics that distinguish uh, the human species from any other lower forms of life, or, or from uh, actually non-living aspects of the universe. Um, so one person who's very important in this respect is a Russian biogeochemist by the name of Vladimir Vernadsky, uh, who made some very important discoveries about this, which parallel or actually complement Mr. LaRouche's own fundamental discoveries in the late uh, 1940s and early 1950s. Uh, Vernadsky demonstrated that there are three aspects of the universe that are distinct. Okay? The domain of the non-living, uh, the domain of the living, which is what he called the biosphere, and the domain of, of human cognitive or noetic activity, which he called the noosphere, or human thought. And all of these domains are guided by a certain intention for development. In the lower two domains, the individual creature, whether it's a rock, or an atom, or your pet cat, your pet dog, <coughs> is not really aware of this process. Uh, so far as we know, human beings have a unique capability to discover and to use the principles which guide the development of the universe. Both the lower two domains, the non-living and the living, uh, and this is what we call science, as well as the higher domain of the principles of the creative human mind itself and the development of human culture. And this is more related to what's called statecraft classical art, particularly music. And as I believe Matthew also is going to discuss later, uh, Bernadsky demonstrated that the development of the biosphere is guided by an intention towards living creatures of increased complexity, increased diversity, increased consumption of matter, and increased energy flux density. Now, if you remember what I had said, and the uh, ideas that have become so-called popular with, by <clears throat> the environmentalist movement, they might agree with you, yes, you know, diversity, biodiversity, that's good, but somehow they don't like the idea of increased consumption of matter, increased consumption of energy, but in fact, this is uh, what characterizes the development of the universe, it's a principle so the directionality towards the development of the biosphere. Uh, and this principle of development, which guides the development of the biosphere as a whole, is reflected in a new way in the noosphere, in the domain of creating human reason, where a man can discover and apply the principles which cause leaps in the progress of the human species and the ability to sustain ever greater number of human beings living under the material and cultural conditions which allow every child to have a life which makes a necessary contribution to the future development of mankind. These leaps in progress have been associated historically with man's use of what's called fire, but fire of increasing energy flux density, such as the progression um, from the burning of wood the burning of coal, the burning of oil and natural gas, the uh, use of uranium, nuclear fission, and <clears throat> soon uh, the development of thermonuclear fusion. This, as you can see, is a chart of what's called energy flux density in terms of kilowatts per person in the United States over the last 200 and some years. Um, and the point to note is if you look at the uh, right side of the chart, and that those two lines will not have anything colored underneath them. These were the projections uh, in A, projection in 1962 of the John Kennedy administration, of the increase in energy flux density that was supposed to occur through the development of nuclear fission, which never happened. And the second projection is an analysis that we did in 2013 of what was possible and should have been unleashed. Uh, neither of these trajectories happen. Um, so, from the standpoint of both the principles that guide the development of life in the biosphere and the corresponding principles that, divide, that are responsible for the development of human life, 
Uh, this shutting down of the rising of the energy of flux density is uh, not natural. It's in fact totally contrary to the lawfulness of the universe. Um, how much time do I have? All right, so. So the uh, great uh, German space scientist, Kraft Erika, you see here, uh, who at one point worked very closely with uh, Mr. and Mrs. LaRouche, developed a conception consistent with this outlook of Vernadsky that life first developed as single-celled organisms deep in the oceans, protected from the harmful radiation from the sun by the water. Uh, then a species of life developed was capable of using photosynthesis and creating oxygen, which uh, caused havoc with some of these organisms. And uh, <coughs> new organisms uh, um, emerged that were able to use oxygen. Uh, you had the, the develop the, a lot, this allowed uh, living forms to leave the ocean and move on to land, the development of more complex forms of life, animals, plants, and eventually the emergence of, of mankind. And from the standpoint of Prakterica, there was no reason why this historical process of the development of life on Earth should be viewed as occurring within a closed system. The view that we are confined to an Earth that has limited resources, that uh, growth will therefore have to be stopped at some point. He was very much opposed to this outlook uh, that there were limits to growth. And he developed the conception of an extraterrestrial imperative that the only way to maintain Earth as a biological center for a growing human population would be to uh, begin to explore and develop the resources of the nearby solar system beginning with the moon. Uh, this is precisely what China now is doing with their space program. Within the next two years, China will be landing on the back side of the moon, partly to make some discoveries about what's happening in the, world, the universe that we're not able to uh, determine from the Earth. We're living in very noisy uh, electromagnetic environment in certain parts of the spectrum, but even more so to make use of something called helium-3 that is very rare on the Earth but exists in large amounts on the surface of the Moon. It would be the perfect fuel for the development of thermonuclear fusion. And so finally, uh, what I wanted to indicate is that uh, Mr. LaRouche himself developed a conception uh, that if you look back 10,000 years and look at what human civilization was, you had a seafaring culture. This is the ending of the previous ice age, huge glaciers on continents. So where did mankind exist? Mankind exists on the oceans, and the ability to navigate the oceans through, through using ships, the ability to, to uh, understand where you're going by a knowledge of astronomy. And that Therefore, if you ask where the human settlements existed, they existed along ocean coasts. At a later point, uh, you had the ability of mankind to be able to move upstream, up the rivers. At a much later point, when you started having the development of canal systems that would link one river to another river, you had the ability to use water transport to get into the interior of continents. With the development of the steam engine, which uh, Gottfried Leibniz, which Jill mentioned earlier, had something to do with, and the development of railroads, you had the ability to uh, begin to uh, conquer the landlocked areas of continents. And what we're looking at now <clears throat> with what's called the World Land Bridge, which is the idea that we uh, are determined to get the United States, Europe, and even Canada to uh, uh, collaborate with China and other nations on, we're coming to, to the culmination of an entire, uh, what Mr. LaRouche calls, economic platform of economic development in terms of de developing the capabilities on Earth. But then that means that just simply becomes the jumping off point for the further development of mankind in space. And um, Mr. LaRouche had a recent discussion with some members of his scientific research team about how this conception of craft era in terms of the extraterrestrial imperative when put together with uh, a proposal that has been made by Russia for there to be, to be collaboration among nations on what's called the strategic defense of Earth. Uh, the nations should not be thinking in terms of what do we have to do to protect ourselves from the Russians or this group or that group. Uh, one of the biggest threats that we're faced with, and we may be seeing something more about this uh, from one of our later speakers, is 
for example, asteroids. And uh, that, that's a threat to the entire uh, planet. To be able to do anything about that, we have to not only develop the capabilities, the platform to sustain uh, the, the necessary development within the near solar system, to be able to intercept uh, an asteroid, to know that it's coming, to be able to intercept it if it were to be on a trajectory to hit the Earth. But then even more so, the, the question that's really posed by what LaRouche is getting at in this paper is, if you look back <coughs> over you know, tens of thousands of years of known human history, the, the fundamental question that, that uh, is confronted is you often have times in history where you have a renaissance. But at a certain point, something goes wrong, and the renaissance collapses. Well, we're in a, time, a period in history right now where you can't have a situation where you have a renaissance in one country and a collapse in another part of the country. Under conditions of a collapse, the entire uh, condition of humanity is in peril, particularly in an age of thermonuclear weapons. So it's essential uh, not only to, to think in terms of how to collaborate to uh, defeat these threats coming from asteroids or other things, but also the question is what is the nature of the human mind? What are the laws of human creativity? You know, wh why, how do you create the conditions under which instead of having a Beethoven or an Einstein or someone like that appearing once a century, can you create a condition of collaboration among nations around a long-term perspective for what humanity must do so that it becomes uh, the natural process to have an increase in proliferation of such geniuses. And so that's the standpoint that I want to just briefly reference because we have a lot of time here. That's the standpoint from which to uh, discuss what do you have to do in terms of policy. Glass-Steagall is the on a simple level of separating commercial banking from the investment banking, eliminate all the speculative uh, uh, garbage. That gives you the ability to have a, a banking system. Uh, you're going to be hearing from our next speaker about what a national bank should be, according to Alexander Hamilton. And then uh, what's called uh, credit, which can be used for the reconstruction of nations. Uh, but from the standpoint of the principles have been discussing, the question is what kind of investments uh, should such credit be directed to? It should not be directed to anything less than the required platform on one level to complete, for example, the world land bridge, but to complete that as a stepping stone towards the next higher platform, which is mankind's mastery of a the near space condition. Uh, and then the final uh, uh, one of Mr. LaRouche's law is the es essential necessity of making breakthroughs in areas like thermonuclear fusion, which is going to be required for developing this higher platform. You sort of ask yourself, how many windmills or how many solar panels uh, could provide this, the power to, to power a lunar colony so we can find out you know, what to do about these asteroids? I don't think that's going to function. Um, so anyway, that's what I have to say. <laughs> called Poetry Must su uh, Supersede Mathematics and Physics, which some people might think provocative title. Um, but what Mr. LaRouche, uh, who made certain discoveries in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, uh, demonstrated the connection between uh, creative discovery by a human individual, whether it be a discovery of a physical principle of nature, such as in the physical well, sciences, science. or whether it be a discovery of an artistic principle, involves exactly the same capabilities of the human mind. And it, it's this process of discovery of... Uh, people may have seen this uh, um, paper that Mr. LaRouche wrote, uh, was uh, published in June of uh, 2014, called The Four New Laws to Save the United States, USA, Now, Not an Option, immediate, an Immediate Necessity. Um, and for the first thing I want to say about this is that um, this uh, writing, which is relatively short, yeah, some of you may, may or may not have uh, had a chance to read it, um, might, uh, might strike you as sort of, what is he talking about? Um, but 
um, I would draw to your attention that one of the, uh, the title of one of the papers that Mr. LaRouche wrote could have been back in the 1970s or the 1980s, I'm not sure, in cooperation in space. Uh, this <clears throat> process that was launched in 2013, building upon what China had done going back over a generation, has already created a, a real explosion of development in the world. Uh, already this uh, project uh, in Eurasia is 12 times larger than the Marshall Plan, which is a plan that rebuilt Germany after World War II. It involves now 100 nations or in, uh, large uh, international organizations. And it's a, a, a policy that extends beyond Eurasia into Africa, into South America. Uh, and it was just about two weeks ago a presentation that Helga LaRouche gave at a conference of economists in Peru uh, around this time, uh, June 2014, June of 2014, it was already clearly evident that a process had been set into motion when the uh, president of China, Xi Jinping, announced in Kazakhstan uh, a proposal uh, to take the model that China had used over the last previous 30 years to lift 700 million people out of poverty and to make this model available for other nations around the world. He proposed what he called a new Silk Road policy. Uh, this is what he's referred to as a win-win cooperation between nations in Eurasia using modern technologies such as high-speed rail, nuclear fission, research in uh, thermonuclear fusion, truthful of universal physical principles that is responsible for causing an increase of what he called relative potential population density, the ability of the uh, human species to raise itself to a higher level of existence on the planet. Um, so this piece does have that character that if you sort of dig into it and are not exactly sure what he means, if you look back at some of the papers that Mr. Lewis has written going back decades, you'll find uh, what he said on this. So I just want to briefly um, uh, indicate that when Mr. LaRouche wrote this uh, paper, he wrote it with the idea of intervening on two processes that are occurring in the world. One of them we've already heard about. Namely, that, as Gilles mentioned, uh, that you had 